Today we're going to do a leisurely Sunday dinner. And what's better for a Sunday dinner than a leg of lamb? Leg of lamb served with flageolet, which is a green bean from France. I want to start with that leg of lamb. I have a whole bone out leg of lamb here. Each piece cut in half, it's which is about three, three and a quarter pound. And uh, I'll remove that one. I have enough with this and show you that by the time I finish cleaning it up of all sinew and fat, I will lose probably a pound, uh, a pound of meat. So if you go to the butcher and buy one, whether it's with or without the, um, the bone, you know, that you remove it, be sure to take that into consideration when you order it, but you know that it's going to lose quite a lot. Now the fat uh, of the lamb, particularly as you can see, I open it between the different muscles here to get into the sinew and the fat inside. There is that large lump of fat right here that I'm removing. This is actually the lamb of fat where there is a, a gland inside. You know that people refer to that gland right there. Uh, we remove all of this. A bit even of the skin, it's more skin, silver skin here rather than fat, but we still remove it to get it as clean as possible. Remember that's very important for us, not only uh, in terms of calorie also, but frankly even in terms of taste because the, the fat of lamb is quite strong and uh, I would rather clean it up completely. So I have a solid piece of meat here. And as I say, in the amount that I have here, close to three quarter, three quarter of a pound to a pound. So that piece would be about two and a half, two and a quarter, two and a half pound. I open it a little bit so that we can put the seasoning inside. And the seasoning that I'm going to do here is garlic. I have cloves of garlic here, which I'm going to mash up with anchovy filet, I have those anchovy filet right there, and maybe two cloves of garlic. I'll crush the garlic there, add it to the anchovy filet, chop it together. It's a classic kind of mixture, you know, sometimes the garlic certainly, and with that I put some herbe de Provence, that mixture of different type of herb from Provence, where I even have those tiny lavender flowers in it. You know, and all that will be our mixture inside the lamb. As I was saying, the, the, the garlic is a classic accompaniment to the lamb, and very often we take a little sliver of garlic and just make hole in the meat and put it inside. So there, I'm going to spread out that mixture here and there on the meat. Now, conventionally, you know, salt, freshly ground pepper, then I roll it back together to make it whole. Conventionally, especially now, people tend to cook their lamb very rare. And it's perfectly fine. Yet, in that particular one, I decide to do a, whoop, to do a long, a long braise type of uh, roast, you know? Because it is not, be the reason that we're doing it now in Nouvelle Cuisine, rare lamb, because it's fashionable and so forth, is perfectly fine, but uh, braised lamb is still quite very good. So what we are doing here is to doing a little uh, tying up here, which is actually just a loop that you're doing here. And that loop, a loop like this, you slide it under it and tying it up. You can tie chicken like this, you can tie uh, roast of veal or whatever, then you bring it on the other side to do the other side also. And basically, again, turn it and start at the beginning, you tie it up together. Now we have a beautiful roast, very lean, ready to be cooked, and that has to roast for like 30 minutes. And that's what I have here. I have one which has been roasting all along 30 minutes and nicely brown all over. And this is the way I want it to look. At that point, the second step is to put onion into it. I have a large onion here. Cut it into a inch or half inch type of pieces. And I want close to two cups of onion here. You know that I roast around. You can let it, you can let it uh, roast for a couple of minutes. Then addition of water. I have half a cup of water here. 
I have half a cup of water, and believe me, by the time I finish cooking it, I'm going to have at least three cups of juice. And this is what I have here, the cooked lamb. But while this is cooking and this starting, let me move to the flageolet. And the flageolet are those green beans, which are half green, a bit like the lima beans that we do in the US, and they are classic in France. Uh, and used in different parts of France, but particularly with lamb. So be sure to pick up all of the dead little pieces inside, which I have cleaned up before. I have half a pound of the flageolet here. And to this, I add chicken stock and water, about three cups of each, uh, three cups altogether, rather. And with this, I put a little bit of salt. Then I will put onion, leek, carrot, you know, all of those vegetables in there. You can cut them a bit finer than I'm, than I'm doing, or in bigger piece. The leek, the onion, the carrot, all of that goes in there and cook together. Often we cut that into a small brunoise, you know, which is a smaller dice, but this will be fine. And basically you bring that to a boil, you start it in cold water as we did here, you cover it, bring it to a boil and cook it for about an hour, an hour and a half, depending on it. And this is what I have here. You want to finish it with fresh tomato and a little bit of olive oil. I don't have any fat in it now. So just a little bit of this to finish for the color. And just the tomato, just eating up is enough, you know. We have them here, and with that now, I want to show you the lamb that I have, which is totally cooked here. And as you will see, still boiling gently, this has reduced considerably. So I will remove this here, and what I want to show you particularly is the amount of liquid that I get out of it. You know, remember, I started only with uh, with half a cup of liquid, and look at all of what I have left here. I'm putting it in there purposely because the reason is all the fat will come to the top so I can scoop the fat here. You should have, even though, you know, I had like a teaspoon of uh, oil to start with, there will be some fat still coming out of the lamb. So I remove it here. The lamb now, you want to cut it, remove the string, don't forget to remove the string and then serving it in a type of bourgeois manner, you know, on a large plate like this, on a large platter like this. You can serve some beans separate. I have a bit too much beans here. Spread them around this way. Then slice, a, slice our, uh, our lamb, or at least some of the lamb. This is pretty hot. I can see the garnish in the center of, uh, of the anchovy filet and so forth. And as you can see, this is pretty generous portion. Uh, this is calculated for four, you know, that little roast that we have here. Then, of course, don't forget to put some of the juice on top. You have a lot of the onion there and the juice on top and around on the beans in the classic way. And maybe finishing it up with a little bit of green. I have a little bit of chives here, which will be good on top. Sprinkle it nicely a bit all over. And this is our leisurely Sunday dinner. And now with our roast of lamb, or to continue or finish our meal, I'm going to show you how to make fruit tartelette. And the fruit tartelette here, I'm going to do a very simple dough in a food processor. I have a really minimal amount of flour here. I have two thirds of a cup of flour, so it's very minimal, and three tablespoons of butter. Uh, a little dash of sugar and a tiny dash of salt. And you can add, if you want, maybe two teaspoons so of a little bit of oil. So it's relatively lean. And what we want to do is to process it a little bit and see if it gets too crumbly, as it is crumbly now, not getting together, you add a little bit of water. Maybe a tablespoon at the most, probably not even a tablespoon. What happens is that Maybe a dash more. I may have a tablespoon of water here. 
What happens is that uh, the moisture in the flower is going to be different. So sometimes you may need more, sometimes you may need less, sometimes you may need no water at all. I have done though in New York in full summer when it's very humid, where I do a puff paste using a pound of flour and almost a pound of water in it. And at some other time, six, seven ounces of water. So that will change. Anyway, the dough here would be nice to rest a little bit, but uh, I want to show you how to do it. So I'm going to use it right away. And one of the best way, again, to roll it and to avoid using more flour is to do it in between plastic wrap this way. Uh, it's also the recipe that my wife liked the best because I don't dirty the table, I don't dirty the rolling pin, I don't dirty anything at all. So it is the best dough, however you want to look at it. So we roll this as you see. Be sure that when you roll it, you will see that the pieces of plastic wrap will tend to go one underneath, so get them loose again to be sure that they are not sticking too much. You can place them back again loose on top of it or look on the other side in the same way. Then you can extend it further. We're doing a very, very thin dough here. And here is what happened. Now I have that thin dough. And we want to cut tiny tartelettes about that size per person. And I'll have one here. See, two. And uh, if I put a little piece of dough right here extend it with my finger. I have three out of that. And with the trimming, I can do an, uh, the, the fourth one, you know, easily. So what you would want to do is actually to take it directly like this and put it on your cookie sheet. Uh, let's see the second one. And I do in the same way. I just want to show you that I can do four with this. Two. And the third one, I will add some of that dough. See, I have three here. And the third one, I will add a little bit of that dough here, that corner there, to bring that together. I don't want to rework it, rework it out too much, but just placing it like this. Again, my plastic wrap. And I should have my fourth one here, as you can see, so I'm not really losing any dough. Just about one here, you see? So then, here is my trimming. I even have dough left over, so here it is. So I have three which have been done here in the same way as you can see. Taking that one, putting it there. And arranging on top, I'm arranging apricot. You know, nice apricot. Like this, you do segment of apricot and segment of plum that I have here. You can vary any type of uh, fruit that you have, of course. What I try to do is to follow the season. Try to, to have your wedge approximately the same size, you know? And then you can start doing a, a pinwheel like this, all around. So those are tartelettes as opposed to tart. Tart would be, of course, the large one. The tartelettes are the small individual one that I do here. I do them with banana in the winter and sometimes with a bit of a sweet dough, you know, so you can vary them basically at will. Uh, conventionally also, the tartelettes are going to, done, to be done with a side and by doing them with a side, you of course use much more, uh, use much more dough. So the problem that we have, you can take a little piece of extra thing to put on top here. The problem that you may have is that it will run on the, on the sheet and that's why so we put, I know in the recipe we have two tablespoons of sugar, so it's half a tablespoon, teaspoon and a half, then pear tart. And this is it, you want to put that in the oven. Notice that I put that on parchment paper, which is going to help a little bit, hopefully. And you put them in the oven. I have some here which has just been finished. And as you can see, they do run on the tray around. So you have to be very careful that now that they are hot, you know, when they are hot, now they come out of the oven, the caramel is still uh, soft, you know. This is when you have to take it out. Don't let that caramel get hard there. 
because uh, you're going to have a hard time moving it around. But now that it's hot, you know, it's better. Actually, I'm going to change this one. I like the other one better. Here it is. Okay, you could put that with a little bit of glaze if you want an apricot glaze or leave it by itself and maybe decorate it with a tiny spring of meat. It's a light, delicious little tartelette. And now we want to move to the first course and the first course is actually uh, a spaghetti squash with the sauce. And we're going to start with the sauce. The sauce is, of course, a tomato sauce. And I'm starting by putting a little bit of olive oil in there. Some onion that we're going to put into the sauce. Always onion, tomato, uh, basil, or thyme, you know, will go well with it. I have some herbe de Provence here, that tiny mixture of herb, similar to Italian seasoning, but it has a little lavender seed in it. And then tomato. Boy, those onions are strong. Tomato. I'm going to have an extra tomato here. The tomato, you see, you do it very coarsely here. Very, very coarsely. It doesn't really matter because we are going to strain it. In fact, what you could do, you could even put garlic, which I'm going to put, but in a different way. But you could put a whole head of garlic this way in there because we are going to strain it anyway. Then in addition to that here, a little dash of salt and a bit of water. So this is a straight tomato sauce and you don't want it to cook it too long. You want it to cook it 15 minutes to still get that taste of fresh tomato with it. And this is what I have here. I have that fresh tomato with it. So what I'm going to do is to strain it. Yes, right in there. I'm putting it in a food mill, as you can see here. Why in a food mill? Well, the reason is that I am actually uh, leaving the skin, the skin of the tomato and all that thing. So you put it through the food mill. If you were to take the skin or the seed out of it, then you wouldn't have to do that. But there, it's one of the best way of doing it. You know, very coarsely, you throw everything in a pot and uh, strain it after. And in there, I'm going to have the little piece of skin a little piece of skin, seed, that's it. But a kind of chunky tomato sauce, you know, very natural looking and very good tasting. So this is going to go in it. In addition to this, I want to put garlic in there, a lot of garlic, but the garlic I'm going to put it in a different way. I'm going to roast it first. And what you do, you take a little piece of aluminum foil, brush it with, uh, with a bit of oil, and cut all head of garlic in half this way to expose the whole head and put the whole head flat, directly flat on the, on the, cu the cutting side, you know, the cut side of those head of garlic, directly on the oil things. Put it there, you wrap it this way. I use that for many other things, for certain type of dressing where I want a puree of garlic. That you put that in the oven for about 45 minutes, 400 degree, and then your garlic will be nice and smooth soft rather, like it is here. Sometimes it stick a little bit, so watch out. You can see how brown it is. See some of them stick. Whole head, all clover garlic are delicious like this. So what we want to do, we want actually to squeeze all of that garlic into our sauce here. See, and they will squeeze out of the shell. So as I say, it's used for other things. Sometimes with a special cheese, I serve clove of garlic like this. It's a neat way of doing it. Or then other garnish with all kind of grilled fish or grilled vegetable. You want to have all roasted garlic and you press it like that. You get your puree of garlic. You know that the garlic done this way is very mild, very mild in taste. So that would be part of it. And with that, we want to do the spaghetti squash. I don't know if you ever had spaghetti squash. Uh, it's kind of uh, new. It was new to me. Uh, a few years ago, it's kind of hard, and, uh, but now we use it regularly at home. You see this here is all strand of spaghetti. Inside of this there is the seed that you do want to remove, and I'm removing the seed here. 
we can use those seeds also. And what we do, brush a little bit of oil on a cookie sheet like that and place this cut sign down directly on this. That's it. And you want to put that into the oven. And that goes in the oven for like an hour, you know, at the 400 degree also. And basically, what you get is this. What I have here. And I want to show it to you. As you can see now, it's roasted and it's soft. And we can remove the spaghetti out of it. You see, look at those things. It looks exactly like spaghetti. Of course, it doesn't have the calorie of spaghetti and not the taste either, but it's a nice, uh, great thing to do, you know. So you get your spaghetti out of it. I get as much on this side. And what you want to do if you do that ahead, you know, you may want to read one of the best ways to read that directly in a microwave oven or then in a conventional oven. You see, what you would want to do there is to put a little bit of olive oil, a dash of salt on top of it, so that you can separate your, th your strand, you know, separate your strand of spaghetti. And then you eat it up this way and serve it with our sauces that we're going to have here. You may put first a bit of the sauce on your plate, a regular spaghetti sauce, you know, that you have there on your plate. And uh, my fake pasta on top of it here, as you can see, maybe with a little bit extra sauce on top. You want a few double. Parmesan cheese, of course, like a regular pasta. And maybe a little spring of fresh oregano, make it a bit more Italian. And with our leisurely Sunday dinner, we're going to start today with those amazing spaghetti squash. You know? We really look like spaghetti and uh, very fresh and nice. And we have that roast of lamb, which is cooked a long time, braised slowly in the oven for three hours. And then with that, our flageolet, those green beans, similar to uh, a little bit to the lima bean that we have here. Very flavorful, very homey, very comforting, and so forth. Then a salad. And of course, we'll finish with those little tartelettes that we made with apricot and, um, and plum today. And with our dinner, we're going to have a Grand Cru from saint Emilion, which is a Bordeaux wine. Without any Cabernet Sauvignon, most of the saint Emilion are made of Cabernet Franc and Merlot. This one is mostly Merlot, a very robust, very rich type of wine with plum taste. It's going to go perfect with the meal that we have today. I hope you will enjoy that wine, doing your leisurely dinner for your family, as I have done for you. Happy cooking. <laughs>